And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. Test us and know our anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful ways in us. And we pray, Father, that you would lead us in your everlasting way. For it's in Jesus we pray it. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Monday morning, I was talking with uh, Marlene, my wife, and I said to her, you know, I'm going to be preaching on fasting come Sunday, and I was wondering, perhaps I should try to fast this week in preparation for the sermon, and she gave me two great points of advice, and the first thing she said is that if you're going to fast, then you need to do it for the right reason. And that's really what Christ is telling us here. He's concerned with our heart motives, that we take on fasting for the right reason. And then the second thing she said was that whatever day you choose to fast, make sure it's not a day when a family from church is bringing a meal over to our house. (laughs) That was even better advice. Now, I did not fast this past week. And I confess that fasting has not been a discipline that I have practiced in my Christian walk. I did practice fasting during my college years, but that was a long time ago. I have not fasted since then except only on very rare occasions. And so instead of being thin and sassy before you today, I'm rather fat and happy. But my hope for all of us this morning is that God will convince us of the value and the importance of fasting as a regular discipline in the Christian faith and as a means of grace meant to draw us into deeper communion and relationship with God as our Father. Now, when God in Christ gives us this instruction on fasting, it comes within the context of the Sermon on the Mount. And so I want to say a few things about the Sermon on the Mount. And the first thing we notice about the Sermon on the Mount is that the Sermon on the Mount is countercultural. It is anti-worldly. Christians are to be different from the rest of the world. And this is true of the Christian discipline of fasting in that the world teaches us to be consumers and to indulge in anything and everything that brings us pleasure. We are taught by the world to withhold no good thing from self because self is king and self deserves anything and everything it desires. And so fasting by its very nature is meant to deny self, to restrict self, to limit self. And so fasting in itself, if done in a God-honoring manner, is an anti-worldly practice that is meant to say no to self. Now the second observation about the Sermon on the Mount is that particularly in chapter 6, the focus is on sincere and genuine worship before God. In Matthew 6, Jesus addresses the hypocrisy as it relates to giving to the poor in verses 2 through 4. He's addressing prayer in verses 5 through 6, and then fasting in verses 16 through 18. 
And what he is telling us in those verses is that we are not to perform these deeds of devotion so as to be seen by men or to impress people so that we may gain their applause or their approval. And it really comes down to whom we have chosen to be our audience. Have we chosen to exalt ourselves before people? Or have we chosen to humble ourselves before God who sees our hearts? We can fool people, but we cannot fool God. Do our hearts match our actions and our appearances and our words? Or are we living with one message with our hearts and another message with our deeds? I've chosen a definition for fasting from Don Green that reads, Fasting is the voluntary abstinence from food for spiritual purposes. Fasting is the voluntary abstinence from food for spiritual purposes. And this morning we are going to consider two points. First, why should we fast? And then secondly, fasting leads to the ultimate feast. So why should we fast? Notice in this passage that Jesus assumes that his audience is practicing the discipline of fasting as a normal part of the Christian life. In verse 16, Jesus says, and when you fast. In verse 17, he says, but when you fast. Notice he's not saying, and if you fast, but when you fast. As you are fasting, remember these words. So Christ is assuming that his audience of his followers are practicing regularly this discipline of fasting. We learn in the Old Testament that there were a number of reasons why the saints of God fasted before the Lord. One reason was God's people fasted in order to offer their heartfelt repentance or even to offer confession for the sins of others. We see Ezra doing this in Ezra chapter 10 verse 6. The people of Nineveh fasted when the prophet Jonah pronounced God's judgment on them and they repented of their sin and God showed them mercy towards towards them as they fasted and prayed to the Lord. A second reason why saints in the Old Testament fasted was God's people fasted during times of crisis when they were desperate for God's help. The Jews fasted when they were threatened with extermination in the book of Esther under the evil hand of Haman. King David fasted and wept for his dying child in 2 Samuel chapter 12. King Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah fasted when a great multitude, an army came against them and they were badly outnumbered and they cried out to to the Lord and the Lord delivered them. A third reason why we see saints in the Old Testament fasting is that God's people fasted to express their sorrow for the death of someone they loved. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12, David and Israel wept and fasted over the deaths of King Saul and his sons. And then fourthly, A fourth reason why the Old Testament saints fasted was to share what they had with others. And we see this in Isaiah chapter 58. The entire chapter speaks about fasting. And uh, the first half of that chapter deals with the abuses of fasting. And then the second half deals with the benefits of fasting. And Isaiah 58 verses 6 and 7 say, Is not this the fast that I choose? to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your home when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? 
And so they were fasting in order that they might give to others. Now before we go any further, I want to list two misconceptions regarding fasting. And the first misconception is this, that fasting is only for Old Testament saints. In other words, it's often said that fasting is not for Christians in the modern era. Fasting is an outdated practice and it's no longer required. But Jesus differs from that opinion. In Matthew 9, Jesus was asked why his disciples never fasted. And this is what Jesus said. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Well, Jesus has been taken away from us into heaven as he sits upon the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And we are between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And Christ is saying, this is the time for the church and the followers of God to fast. We see the New Testament church fasting in Acts chapter 13 verse 2 and chapter 14 verse 23. And so fasting is indeed relevant to our Christian lives today. And then the second thing we must keep in mind in terms of a misconception is that fasting is a means to persuade or manipulate God. There is a danger in thinking that we as sinful humanity can move a holy God by our self-denial and sacrifice in order to get what we desperately want from Him. If it is up to our striving and merit to convince God, then we are in trouble. We We neither understand the depth of our own depravity or the heights of God's righteousness and holiness. Instead, we must approach God with lives founded upon the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must understand that Jesus has earned for us a reconciled relationship with our Heavenly Father through His atoning sacrifice and through His obedient life. God listens to His children not because of what we have achieved, but because of what He has achieved. We are now beloved sons and daughters of God, and now through Christ, God is committed to our good, and He will not shrink from that commitment as we are in covenant with our God. We should never think that God is somehow indebted to us because of some extraordinary sacrifice that we are making. If fasting reveals anything about us, what it really reveals is our utter helplessness, not our righteous devotion. And so we must approach Christ and God with that gospel foundation. So why then do we fast? In John Stark's book, The Possibility of Prayer, he states, but biblical fasting is different. It is not a way of asserting what we need or want. It is a way to open ourselves up to the presence of God. And so here is the prize that is that comes to us through fasting, a deeper enjoyment of our God. Daniel Doriani said, we are not slaves to our appetites. More than that, we fast to show that we have a hunger that exceeds our hunger for food. And we've already read Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and He relents over disaster. Disaster. 
So we fast to nourish our hunger for God and to reduce our hunger for this world. John Starks again puts it this way. He says, the growl of our stomachs reminds us that we also have a growl in our souls. Next time your stomach is growling, remember that you have a growl in your soul and in your heart as well. And so fasting leads to the ultimate feast. And I think many outside the church, even those inside the church, they have a certain view of what Christians are like. And I think most people think that we are somber and we are depressed and we are gloomy and we are solemn and we are serious and we are dull and we are joyless and we are drab. That's what they think, right? But the truth is that by fasting, we are letting go of those ties that bind us to this worldly existence, and we are anticipating the far greater feast of enjoyment with God our Father. In other words, fasting leads to feasting. Fasting is not an end in itself. It leads to that great banquet of enjoying God. And I think the mistake we often make is that we partake of the uninspired, mediocre meals of this world that appeal to our eyes and to our flesh and to our pride, and we forfeit the banquet meal. That meal that is prepared for us in Christ And enjoyed in the presence of God. C.S. Lewis said this in The Weight of Glory. He said, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. John Stark in his book Possibility of Prayer puts it in these terms. He said, suppose John Stark's wife said to him one morning, Honey, I am going to prepare a feast tonight, and I am making balsamic seared lamb. And so John goes off to work, and before he arrives at work, he has this huge breakfast of eggs and bacon and waffles. And then he has a 10 o'clock business appointment, and he downs a cup of coffee and a Danish And then he comes to lunch and he has some zeta along with a side of garlic bread. And then he's starting to feel the hunger pangs in the afternoon and he picks up a big Snickers bar and he downs that. (laughs) And so then he arrives at home and dinner is ready. The feast is prepared. John's wife has prepared the lamb that is paired beautifully with Dijon glazed carrots and roasted butternut squash with garlic and parsley, and the dessert is on its way. But John is not hungry. It is an amazing dinner, and it doesn't even entice him. What should he have done? He should have had a piece of toast for breakfast, and maybe a salad for lunch, and he should have endured the pangs during the afternoon, But the feast was waiting for him, and he wasn't ready for it. God is our feast, and so often we have nibbled on the lesser things of the world that we have no hunger for our God. When someone prepares you a feast, you do not want to be fooled. 
This is our problem. We are too full on the lesser things of this world that we miss the grander things of God. The focus of this passage has to do with the audience we have chosen to serve. Do we seek to be on display for people whom we wish to impress and can only read our external countenance? Is that who our audience is? Or do we live for the audience of one? Our God, eternal, majestic, holy, and glorious. Do we live for the one who can see our hearts? Because you see, fasting is ultimately for God. John Piper in his book, A Hunger for God, writes... The greatest enemy of hunger for God is not poison, but apple pie. It is not the banquet of the wicked that dulls our appetite for heaven, but mindless nibbling at the table of the world. It is not X-rated video, but the prime time dribble of triviality we drink in every night. That's what dulls us. There's a wonderful story by Isaac Dennison. I've shared this with you before. It's also a movie, but it's called Babette's Feast. And it's about a strict, dour, fundamentalist community in Denmark. And Babette works as a cook for two elderly sisters who have no idea that she was once a chef for nobility back in her native France. And Babette's dream is to return to her beloved home city of Paris, and so every year she buys a lottery ticket in order to get enough money to go back to her home. And every night her austere employers demand that she cook the same dreary meal, boiled fish and potatoes. Because they say, Jesus commanded, take no thought of food and drink. But one day the unbelievable happens. Babette wins the lottery. The prize is 10,000 francs, a small fortune. And because the anniversary of the founding of the community is approaching, Babette asked if she might prepare a French dinner with all the trimmings for the entire village. At first, the townspeople refuse. They say, no, it would be sin to indulge in such rich food. But Babette begs them, and finally they relent. And they say, as a favor to you, we will allow you to serve us this French dinner. But the people secretly vowed that while they partake of this meal, they will not enjoy it. (laughs) Because they want to focus on spiritual things believing that God will not blame them for eating the sinful meal as long as they do not enjoy it. So Babette begins her preparations. Caravans of exotic food arrive in the village along with cages of quail and barrels of wine. Finally, the big day comes. The villagers gather together. The first course is an exquisite turtle soup. The diners force it down, but without enjoyment. But although they usually eat in silence, suddenly people are starting to converse with one another. And then comes the wine, the finest vintage in all of France. And the atmosphere changes. Someone smiles. Someone giggles. An arm comes up and is draped over another's shoulder, and someone is heard to say, after all, did not the Lord Jesus say, love one another? By the time the main entree of quail arrives, those austere, pleasure-fearing people are giggling, and they're laughing, and they're slurping, and they're filled with merriment, and they're praising God for their many years together. They are having one joyful celebration. This pack of Pharisees is transformed into a loving community through a gift of a meal. One of the two sisters goes into the kitchen to thank Babette, saying, Oh, how we will miss you. 
when you return to Paris. And Babette replies, I will not be returning to Paris because I have no money. I spent it all on the feast. Can you think of anyone else who gave his all that we might have a feast and be welcomed into the family? Christ surrendered his all upon the cross for you and for me. He has made a way for us to sit at the king's table and to enjoy the richest affair in the presence of our Lord. Let us consider fasting that we might consider and that we might hunger for the deep things of God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, forgive us for settling for the lesser offerings of the world and becoming full so that we miss the feast that gives us communion with you and a deeper dependence upon you. Help us to give fasting a chance in our lives to grow in our hunger for you and to sever our ties to this world. Grant us your grace and goodness in this walk of faith. Give us undivided hearts and hungry souls. All glory to the one who is deserving. In Jesus we pray, amen.